Hurts in chance, Swamsi reacts in this is. Russia's death toll will hit 1 million. Bacha Merchie show. This is World War 1 numbers, man. I mean, I get it, it's modern times, but still, like, damn. It's war between two countries. It's not a world war, right? And it's somehow doing this. Oh, this is some insane shit. This is one of the latest video from Military Show, I guess. Uh, as a war you can direct on past two and a half years, Russia's staggering losses are becoming possible to ignore. The war 600,000 troops lost. Prediction of up to 1 million by 2025. Oh my god. Obviously... Okay, uh, what do you mean by death toll? It, this must mean like uh, casualties. Implying that a lot of them are just going to be either injured or missing in action. Doesn't necessarily mean dead. I'm pretty sure that's going to be the metric, right? So 1 million death toll, that's insane. So let's go this one. Remember, if you like my next one, don't forget to subscribe so that way I know which videos to react to more. Uh, you know, I've been watching these recent videos about conflict a lot. And it's insane how history is unfolding in front of us. How numbers are like this, a million. Like, imagine that. You've seen those like 100,000 or 150,000 people in some big ass stadiums in those durable arena, arenas and other like sports arenas. Those are 100,000 people. You see like how they're like ants literally littered the place. And that's just 100,000 people. Now imagine 10 times more than that. That's how many people are like, uh, you know, like casualties now. That's fucking insane, right? And none of them ask for this. That's the, that's the thing. None of them ask for this, right? Uh, I don't know, man. It's just fucked up. Let's do it. As the war in Ukraine drags on, now past the two and a half year mark, the truth about Russia's staggering losses is becoming impossible to ignore. While the Kremlin stays silent, the mounting graves across Russia tell a chilling story. In 2023 alone, Russia has spent $2.5 million expanding cemeteries, a grotesque sign of the war's true human cost. This isn't just a statistic, it's double what was spent in 2022 and six times the amount in 2020. But the real horror is what's still to come. At the current rate of death, experts predict Russia's troop losses will surge to 1 million by 2025. Think about that, 1 million soldiers gone. The last time a single nation saw such devastation was during World War II, a cataclysm that reshaped the world. Now Russia is hurtling toward this grim milestone in a war Putin refuses to stop. Dra yeah, I'm like, what do I mean? Is it one World War? But yeah, no, it's it's accumulated in World War One. But yeah, a nation, World War Two, yeah, a million was the like numbers in World War Two. Nations usually like saw those numbers. So this is fucked up even for the World War Two numbers. Like that's insane dragging his country deeper into the abyss with every passing day. So how has it come to this? How did one of the world's most feared military forces turn into a machine that consumes its own soldiers faster than it can replace them? And how long can Russia continue throwing men into the meat? Technically, that was the case in Soviet Union as well, during World War II times. Like, look at the Rus you know, Soviet Union losses in World War II. That's insane. Even today, Russia... Even before this conflict, Russia had more women than men because of this reason. Like even after all these decades, they, they, they didn't recover. Meat grinder before it collapses entirely. When you wage a futile war with brutal intensity and reckless persistence, the relentless slaughter of soldiers and civilians becomes an inescapable reality. Here's how Russia's President Vladimir Putin has driven his country and his people toward this devastating milestone reminiscent of history's darkest years. As of August 28, 2024, Russia has lost precisely 618,960 troops in Ukraine, according to the general staff of Ukraine's armed forces. This figure includes both fatalities and soldiers who've been so severely injured on the battlefield that they're no longer able to serve. If you're wondering about the proportion, The Economist reports that for every Russian soldier killed in action, there are roughly three to four wounded. A leaked document from the US Department of Defense leaves room for an even higher number of losses. According to this document, between 462,000 and 728,000 Russian troops have been killed, injured, or captured in Ukraine since the invasion began on February 24th, 2022. That's substantially more troops than Putin. I mean, yeah, like I said in the start of the video, it's going to be like casualties, implying, like he said, like it can be killed, but that number is going to be lower compared to like injured, like someone who cancer or like captured initially prepared for the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, with 190,000 soldiers moving into Ukrainian land on that fateful February day. 
These staggering figures make one thing abundantly clear. Ukrainian soldiers are making the invader pay heavily for every inch of ground gained, even if they're paying quite a high price in the process too. However, whether it's 600,000 or 728,000, this figure is still a few hundred thousand soldiers short of a million. So how exactly could the projected loss of Russian troops reach this mind-blowing figure in a relatively short period? Yeah, to answer this question, all we need is some simple maths. Let's use these figures presented by the general staff of Ukraine's armed forces, as it's been publishing daily reports about the situation on the Ukrainian front line. Relying on these reports, we'll see how many troops Russia lost in a single week in Ukraine. As we mentioned, the last... Yeah, but it's like, of course, Ukrainians are going to give reports of like more casualties because they are the opposing... Yeah, the, I mean, somebody else uh, checked that, right? Not that I don't believe it, it's just like, if I were Ukraine, what does that sound What I'm a country? If I were Ukraine, I would do basically the same thing and inflate the numbers for morale and a lot of things. So is that really accurate? Last available report prior to writing these words was on August 28th. On this date, the General Staff of Ukraine's Armed Forces put the total troop losses at 611,190 soldiers. Let's go back to August 21st to examine the trajectory of the Russian troop losses in a single week. On August 21st, the report published by the General Staff of Ukraine's Armed Forces stated that Russia had lost 603,010 troops since the beginning of its invasion of Ukraine. The very next report, published on August 22nd, put the total number of lost soldiers at 604,140. This means that in a single day, Russia lost 1,130 of its troops. This figure slightly increased the following day, as the August 23rd report pointed to a total loss of 605,330 troops. That's another 1,190 soldiers lost in a day. The next day showed a similar single loss day, with a reported 1,160 casualties. With this number, Russia lost a total of 606,490 troops. From August 25th to 27th, the total number of lost soldiers increased by 2,420. This means that the figure of 610,100 lost soldiers was reported on August 27th. On the last day prior to writing the script for this video, August 27th, Russia lost another 1,090 soldiers, leading to the 611,190 figure we mentioned a few times. So in total, that's 8,180 soldiers lost in a single week, or an average of 1,168 troops per day. Now let's say this loss rate continues uninterrupted, at an average of 1,168 troops lost per day, the staggering figure of 1 million casualties would be reached within 332 days, on July 26, 2025. If we use the figures coming from the US Defense Department as a starting point and keep the same loss rate, it will only take Russia 232 days to have a million of its soldiers wiped from the battlefield. This gives us the grim milestone of April 17, 2025, that's pretty much on par with the predictions of various experts, including Michael Clark, a British academic who specializes in defense studies. In his interview with Times Radio, a British digital radio station, Professor Clark claimed that Russia's troop losses could even reach a million by the end of 2024, given how little Putin cares for the human cost of his devastating military campaign. The new chief of the general staff of the British Army. See, there are two elements to this. Okay, British are not Ukrainian, so. Their metric is like, hmm, maybe there's something to it. He's an expert and everything. But at the same time, judging by his comment, you would think like, of course, he hates Russia and Putin. So he's going to inflate that. But maybe his comments are like that because he sees the losses and he's just like horrified by that. Right. So I don't know how to, you know, like whenever I see like that, like, OK, Ukrainians are saying that British are saying that probably somebody else is vain as well. They can't all be wrong. So this is real metric. That is insane. A million right gonna uh, millions are gonna be the casualty by next year that's insane shit especially of one country in a war between two countries right in just two three years like, this is world war ii numbers right here for a country and you know like i'm surprised people are not being pissed off in russia right after seeing all them there was a recent thing about that right like how uh you know like uh, in because of kursk how like the people were pleading like uh, you know, bring back the, you know, their uh, conscripts and things like that, because conscripts are not treated very fairly and shit like that. Uh, there was something like that, right? So, uh, you know, like, I, I see, like, civil unrest rising because of this. Army General Sir Roland Walker has laid out even more pessimistic forecasts for the Russian troops. 
General Walker believes that Putin will sacrifice between 1.5 and 1.8 million people in total to achieve his military goals in Ukraine, which is seizing the four primary regions or oblasts Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia. His exact words were, At the current rate of attrition of dead and wounded, that puts Russia probably well north of 1.5 million casualties to take the four oblasts in Ukraine, with untold billions of lost equipment. He also pointed out the absurdity of such a colossal human cost for a strategic aim that increasingly seems both unreachable and irrational. As General Walker put it, there have got to be more things for Russia to worry about than losing the best part of 1.5 to 1.8 million people for a slice of Ukraine exactly, with man. the way the world is going. Unfortunately, exactly, man. What the fuck? as things currently stand, it doesn't seem like it. In fact, it seems that Russia isn't particularly worried about losing all these troops either. Although, to be fair, the numbers coming from the Kremlin tell a whole different story. The only time the Kremlin... You know, this is, this is what I'm thinking as well, like, for what? What you gonna get out of those four oblasts or four states or whatever? Like, it doesn't matter, like, okay, lithium and all that, like, battery thing, gas. Is that gonna be, like, enough compared to how much losses you already had, how much equipment you lost, how much billions you lost? Not to mention restriction from every single country, which, which is gonna cost you even more. And like 1.8 million people, or whatever you lose, lose who would have like contributed to your economy. You lose all that for what? Four states and whatever resources it has. Is that like, like, does that balance it out? Come on, this is insane. I think what's happened is like he didn't see this coming. Russia didn't see this coming, right? You know, Russia, Kremlin, Putin, Putin's cabinet ministers. I don't, I don't know how that works. Like generals or whatever. I don't think they've seen this coming. They thought the war is going to over fast. And since the war has begun, it didn't over fast. They can't just pull out now. It's about reputation or whatever, right? So they're stuck at this. In the end of the day, nobody's going to gain anything, but like they can't pull out type of way. Publicly acknowledged its troop casualties was in early 2023, and the figure reported was almost insulting in its inaccuracy. At the time, the Kremlin claimed a mere 6,000 Russian soldiers had been killed in Ukraine. A figure that starkly contrasted independent estimates suggesting numbers tens of thousands higher. The disconnect between the official Kremlin figures and the actual losses on the battlefield only deepens the sense of tragedy, as the true scale of human suffering remains hidden behind propaganda and misinformation. Luckily, some Russian independent media outlets have taken great risks to report more accurate figures. As soon as the shameful 6,000 figure came out, Mika Golubovsky, an editor with the now-banned media zona, immediately disputed it. Closely working with BBC Russia and relying on new graves in Russian cemeteries and open-source information from official reports, newspaper, and social media, media zona reported that over 50,000 Russian troops had died in Ukraine. That's eight times more than what the Kremlin had claimed. Despite the inherent danger of challenge and the balls, right? Like somebody living in Russia, being a Russian and actually like having balls to like oppose Kremlin like that. What happened to that guy? Did he disappear or something? Because that's grim. But yeah, it's just something like there are people who like screw that. I'm going to tell what's real, right? People deserve to know type of way. Challenging the official narrative in Russia, Golibovsky and other journalists continued their brave reporting. On July 5, 2024, both Media Zona and another independent media outlet, Medusa, published that approximately 120,000 Russian troops had died since the start of the invasion. That's pretty much on par with the figure that the general staff of Ukraine's armed forces reported at the time. The July 5th report from the staff put the total figure of killed and injured soldiers at 548,580, Using the deaths to injured ratio proposed by The Economist between 1 to 3 and 1 to 4, this suggests that between 109,716 and 137,145 Russian troops. These are K KIAs, so these are definite killed in Exxon. Oh, that's fucked up. So this is definitely the number or close to it. This is not casualty numbers, this is killed in Exxon numbers. Man, 137,000, like. Again, like I said, imagine those like big ass WrestleManias. Even that is like inflated number. That's like 90, 80,000. But imagine like the biggest stadium you can imagine with like people littered there. That's how many died. Just by Russia's side. Like Ukrainians probably lost a lot of them, a lot of people as well. Because it can't like obviously, I don't know if it's going to be close to this or something, but it's going to be a lot. So two stadium worth of people has died for what? This is a fucked up thing, right? In 2020, when pandemic came, I never even imagined like something like this could happen. 
right? I'm pretty sure I just, I just saw a breaking news, something like North Korea either is thinking of attacking South Korea or already attacked South Korea. Like, what the fuck, man? I guess, okay, the new alliance between Russia and North Korea, and it's just like, I guess, based on geopolitics, I can see that happening. Like, why not create pressure somewhere else, create global instability, so pressure isn't that much in the Ukraine, Russia thing or something. I don't know. There could be some background thinking like that going on, which is fucked up, which is what I've been feeling for a long time. This creates an axis and creates a world war like this, right? So I don't know if something like that, I hope North Korea doesn't attack South Korea because after all these wars, we don't need another war. But yeah, I, I, ne I would have never thought of this in 2020, like, oh, pandemic, this is the worst thing that's going to happen. Apparently not. Troops have been killed in action. Thanks to a slip-up from December 2023, it's safe to assume that Putin is well aware of the true scale of Russian troop losses, but he simply doesn't care. As Yevgenia Chirikova, an exiled Russian environmental activist, puts it, the growing number of killed and maimed on both sides does not bother Putin at all. Until Russian troops receive a tough rebuff in Ukraine, no changes will happen. But if Putin is so indifferent to this staggering human cost, why not just report it accurately? Why not use it to rally the nation around a narrative of sacrifice and patriotism, painting the war as a heroic- For what? If they, if they do that, like, Rus Putin, Russia is the one who did the space and military operation, it's not the other way around. If they report real numbers, it's, if anything, they would piss off people even more. It's not in their benefit, right? They can't just uh, claim like, oh, look at how many of our are dying, it's about patriotism, let's rally up. They're, they're, not def they're not in defense. They are the one who started a special military operation. So, yeah, why would they show that number? That doesn't make sense. Military, strategic-wise, it doesn't make sense, right? ...struggle for Russia's survival. While this type of spin would have been possible some tens of thousands of dead soldiers ago, now reporting actual figures can only backfire, revealing the full extent of the disaster that Putin's regime has tried so hard to conceal. But wait a minute, shouldn't the Russian people be well aware that their, their friends, family members and neighbors are dropping like flies in Ukraine? Well, they are. But that's people outside Russia's two largest cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg. You see, Putin has been very careful not to conscript people from these major cities. Why? Because this way, he shields the urban elite from the direct impacts of the war, preventing a potential backlash from those who have the power to question and challenge his decisions. Additionally, not drafting young men from Moscow or St. Petersburg has caused many wealthy Russians to return to these cities after previously fleeing them to avoid the draft, thus offsetting the economic damage done by Western sanctions. But if Moscovites aren't the ones dying on the Ukrainian battlefield, who is? Who makes up the bulk of the hundreds of thousands of Russian troop casualties? To put it simply, they're troops that the Kremlin doesn't care about. Contract soldiers, foreigners, convicts, reservists. They're the ones filling the ranks and bearing the brunt of the casualties. As far as contract soldiers or kontraktniki, as they're called in Russia, go, they receive little sympathy from the public or the Kremlin. After all, they chose to enlist and are well paid for their service. As Sergei Krivenko, a human rights activist from Moscow, puts it, ordinary people do not feel particularly sorry for them, and judging by the measures implemented by the Kremlin, Putin doesn't either. In May 2022, the four- That a million people who are like contracts, how, how, how is that that many who's doing the contract thing? I mean, that changes the spectrum, isn't it? Like, one is like, you have to do it is for your country, it's a duty, right? A draft, conscript, whatever. Other is like, oh, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to choose to do it because I like money. Of course, people aren't going to care about it that much, which is fucked up. Still people, right? Who knows in which conditions they had to, like, oh, this is, it's either this or nothing type of way. So they might not have much other, more option than to do contract, soldiering or whatever. But all of them are like that? Come on, that can't be true, right? So that was like a huge draft conscription thing, right? 200,000 people or something a year or two ago. 40 year age limit for contract soldiers was abolished, allowing applicants up to the age of 65 to enlist. Now you might wonder, why would anyone in their 60s willingly head to a conflict zone? The answer lies in the desperate economic circumstances faced by many Russians. For some, the prospect of a well-paying contract job in the military becomes a lifeline amidst financial hardship. In this regard, the broadening of eligibility reflects a grim calculus. When the cost of war becomes unsustainable, the Kremlin is willing to pull from increasingly desperate or less privileged demographics, prioritizing immediate military needs over long-term human costs. 
To make this brutal calculus possible, the Kremlin has been offering a monthly salary of at least $2,300. To put this figure into perspective, you need to know two facts. One, the salary of a contract soldier before the war in Ukraine was around $360. And two, the national average income in Russia is roughly yeah, this yeah exactly. This is like U.S. dollar. So three thousand U.S. dollar is like what average uh, American uh, makes, right? Is that is it three or is it four? But three thousand something, right, a month. So this is close to that in Russia, which is not the same thing. So national average income is nine hundred. Now they are getting twenty three hundred, which is like a lot. Roughly nine hundred dollars a month, and that's in regions that are better off. In poorer regions, it's half of that, $450. Throw the one-off recruitment bonus of at least $2,200 and high payouts in the event of disability, $33,000, and death, $55,000 into the mix, and it becomes clear why the Kremlin's offer is so tempting to those in desperate financial straits. That's also why the Kremlin- Hold up there, hold up there, hold up there. I just thought of something. What if a lot of killed in accents are not really killed in accents, but just like- Corruption. Somebody said, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write the report that you died. We're gonna split the money, 55,000 or something. Like, we've seen the corruption video in Russia, like how corruption is working in chain of command. Why not this? I could see that happening. And is constantly hiking up the target figures for contract Nikki. In March 2020, Russia had approximately 405,000 of these soldiers. This figure was expected to rise to half a million by 2027. But then Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So the target figures dramatically increased, while the time frame for achieving them significantly shortened. In December 2022, it was announced that 695,000 contract soldiers would be serving in the Russian armed forces by 2026. A year later, in December 2023, the number was increased to 745,000 troops by 2027. Even with all the incentives, it's easy to see why these figures are unlikely to be met without significant strain. That's why the Kremlin resorted to another shameful tactic, coercing individuals who might otherwise have never volunteered for service. In this sense, the war in Ukraine has started to resemble the Chechen Wars, which were primarily fought by forced conscripts. As Kravenko puts it, these soldiers were sent to slaughter, which caused tension and backlash in society, even to the point of creating social movements. However, the Moscow elites are unlikely to launch any sort of social movements for the bulk of the troops coerced into conscription. Why? Because these are primarily made up of foreigners and convicts. According to numerous media reports, foreigners have been coerced to join the ranks of the Russian- Foreigners? Who's the foreigner, like from other country, who's like, okay, I'm gonna join Russian army or contract. I don't care, I don't care if it's $2,300 a month. Really, you can't find other option anywhere else? You're gonna die in a battlefield for, some, for not even your own country? Come on. Russian armed forces in one of three ways. First, they were deceived about the nature of their prospective employment. Second, they were promised Russian citizenship after only a year of service. Third, they were found guilty of breaking Russian law and given the choice between serving a prison sentence and serving in the war. The first disgraceful way is how a 21-year-old from Sri Lanka found himself on the Ukrainian battlefield. He joined the Russian armed forces for the second reason, receiving Russian citizenship, and was told he would only be employed in a non-combat role. Instead, he was thrust into the front lines, far from the safe, supportive role. This is the thing, people, like, you, you should be smarter than that. You should be more, like, I don't know, like, uh, have, you know, just education is not enough, right? You need to know how to think, right? You need to be scientifically literate. If anyone say, by the way, we're going to put you in military, but don't worry, you're not going to see combat. Like, don't believe that shit. You don't know. You don't know, like, there could be last measure thing. Right? Oh, yeah, we promise you that, but like, we don't have any other option. Shit is going down. Okay, you're fighting. There's, there's always going to be that element. Just don't go there. Like, you don't have any other option? Come on. I'm going to get a citizenship in a year. Like, f get citizenship somewhere else, man. Come on. War is not an option, right? Th this is not just some small stuff. This is a proper, proper war, right? People, you know, people dodge, try to dodge war in any means necessary. You're going to go to some other country for like few money and like a citizenship maybe in a year if you're alive. That's insane. Probably been promised. That's how he ended up wounded and captured in Ukraine, which is why he also decided to share his story with DW, a German state-owned broadcaster under the Watch for Live Ukrainian military personnel. When he was first sent to the outskirts of the Russian-occupied Ukrainian city of Donetsk, he told his commander that he wanted to return to Sri Lanka. 
However, he was told that doing so could land him in prison for 15 years per the contract he had signed. So he stayed put, together with dozens of other citizens from India, Kyrgyzstan, Nepal and Tajikistan, all of whom were similarly trapped course, and betrayed India. by the Russian military's duplicitous promises. Besides false promises, the Kremlin also showed it had no- Excuse me, what is Indian government doing at this point, right? Sri Lanka, I guess it can make sense, but Indian government has been flexing a lot recently, right? What is Indian government doing? Like, don't coerce my citizens into doing that, bring them back or some shit. Why are they not doing that? I don't know, man. No problem changing the rules of the game whenever it felt like it. Before the war, foreign military recruits had to complete a five-year contract in the armed forces to obtain Russian citizenship. Once Russian soldiers started dying in bulk, this period was reduced to only one year of service. But here's the kicker. Sure, they'll receive citizenship after a year, however, they'll still have to continue serving, as Putin stipulated that contracts of all Kontrakniki will remain valid until the end of his so-called special military operation in Ukraine. During this period, no contracts can be cancelled, and all of those about to expire must be renewed. In other words, foreign fighters don't get to start over. That's fucked up. You can't just change it like that. Oh, by the way, your contract is just for a year or two years. Oh, by the way, your contracts have to be renewed until the operation is over. That could take, I don't know, a decade plus. Who the fuck knows? Like, at that point, what is the point of contract? You're just going to dictate things? That's fucked up. Seriously, man, Indian government needs to, like, you know, like, you know, get involved. Like, okay, uh, you know, but you need to bring back, like, you know, you need to give a citizen back because there is some point of strength position from India can say that, right? Because India is one of the few countries who's actually buying things from Russia as a, like, a, you know, neutral party. They can just say, like, you, do, you don't screw our citizenship in this citizen in this one, right? In the early wars, like, a lot of Indians were trapped there, right? And uh, Modi basically called for and said, like, okay, I'm going to extract them. Make sure the extraction goes fine, as in, like, don't make sure there's no attack around that area. Right? So you can use some kind of strength position to say, like, bring back our citizens or some shit like that. Why are they not doing that? That's insane. Over in a new country, they get to die as Russians. Russian convicts went through something similar. Initially, the Kremlin was recruiting convicts by promising them a pardon after serving for six months, even if they had been convicted of the most violent crimes. However, as the war dragged on and casualties mounted, the rules changed. The only way for most of these convicts to receive a clean slate was to serve until the end of the war in Ukraine. Also, for many of them, a full pardon was off the table, with only a reduction in their sentences or some other form of leniency being offered. Now, some might see this as just, as people who committed heinous crimes shouldn't be allowed to escape their past so easily. However, the fate of these individuals should be viewed in a greater context. Yeah, also, like, this is concept everywhere when it comes to criminals. Everybody's too hard on the concept of criminals. Oh, they are criminals. Like, okay, all are the same. So there's no difference between a murderer and like somebody who just dodge a bit of tax here and there. Like, what do you mean by criminal? There are many types of criminals. Like, some are much more intense compared to the others. But people group all of them as like, oh, they're all criminal. Who cares? Really? I see that all the time in US, in Russia, basically, around everywhere. Even in India and everywhere. Obviously in India. Right? I see this a lot. Oh, they're just criminals. Who cares? Like, really? All of them are the same? It's just like same group. That's it? That's insane. Their situation shows just how easy it is for the Kremlin to exploit the power it inevitably holds over those in desperate circumstances. These prison recruits have not only been thrust into a perilous conflict under false assurances, but they've been practically used as cannon fodder in a war that offers them no real chance of survival or redemption. Ever since Putin ordered the now late Yevgeny Prigozhin to start recruiting prisoners in June 2022, these inmates turned soldiers became prime meat for the Kremlin's grinder. According to the BBC, the inmates recruited by Prigozhin survived in Ukraine for an average of three months. Those recruited by Russia's Ministry of Defense after... I mean, yeah, look, man, there was a story about how, like, conscripts are not treated fairly even their wages get stolen. And these are their own citizens. Now, imagine somebody, like, who's foreign or, like, some criminal or whatever. They're going to get treated even more worse. Of course, they're going to treat it as cannon fodder. That's insane, like, no thought of human rights, right? <sighs> I get, like, as soon as I say this, it feels weird, like, because of all this war and things, of course, they're not going to care about human rights, but still, like, this is 21st century, it's just fucked up, man. The more I think about this situation, the more my head hurts, the more pissed off I get. This is just insane. You know what, I'm going to stop it here, is like, yeah, a million death roll, that's just insane, right? Like, uh, there will be a news when this number reaches.
a bet like the you know news people like this kind of like a checkpoints you know statements or russia lost a million or something or claim by this and that that will be a major news when this happens that's just fucked up all right well if you like my channel subscribe and i'll see you next time